right. So maybe you can see me. I'm not sure. Anyway, um, very excited to be here. And um, you can kind of see my face before we get started so that it's not too impersonal. I've been at Weber State for just, uh, just under 20 years. I've been working there as a disability specialist and have learned quite a bit. I'm very excited to talk to you a little bit about that, mainly because we're in a really great time to talk about post-secondary disability options. So I don't know if you're aware, but there's, um, there's been quite a bit of movement toward opening the doors of post-secondary education, being more inclusive, increasing our diversity on campus. And since I have been working on a campus, I've seen the results of that, specifically with students with disability. And I, I think um, we're, we're really, um, I think, starting a, a new change um, in terms of, um, all you can see is a poll. Love it. Okay. I don't know. Is that better? <laughs> Maybe I can see it. I'll adjust some things. Anyway, I, just, I think we're on the, the, um, the cusp of something really great in terms of post-secondary options. And I know that I've got a variety of um, parents and um, teachers and maybe even some students. And so I really would welcome all of your questions. I'm going to go back to, um, to my PowerPoint. Are they seeing both? Sorry, yeah. Michelle. Okay, great. So, number one, I just want to talk about um, kind of what, what I'll go over quickly. I want to leave plenty of time for questions. So, I'll talk a little bit about access and accommodation and how disability service offices on campuses support students. Also, the documentation requirements for eligibility, if you're going to um, be working on, on getting services, what that would look like. You'll probably be helping your students quite a bit with that. Also, how to work with faculty, the role of faculty on college campuses, because it's very different than the faculty in K through 12. Also, some resources that are the most helpful, differences between high school and college. And I want to talk a little bit about Weber State's unique program to help students in transition. It's called CAT, C-A-T-T, -T, and it stands for Creating Achievement Through Transition. It was a volunteer program that um, was started by a student with a disability who wanted to reach out and help other students. So it's pretty cool. So let's start out with just disability services on campuses in general. Every post-secondary campus that uh, receives federal funding, including federal financial aid, is obligated to have a disability service person, contact, or office. And you'll see that those offices vary across campuses. Um, but they're all obligated to have some contact. And it's um, legally required that, that that information be accessible so that you can find it quickly, easily, and those officers are, are supposed to be responsive to student needs. So I'm always confused when students say, well, I had no idea that you even had an office on campus because we're on the web. We are on almost every admissions paperwork that gets sent out, at least for Weber State. Um, you can search disability on our website and find everything, and most most offices, that is that is the case. However, students sometimes overlook those things, and, and we don't always um, get the information to where students are going to be because um, it changes so quickly. But just so you know, every campus has an office. And I every campus is a bit different. Their policies and procedures are different, how they operate, uh, expectations of students. And so it's very important that students go on and research those or even go and visit those offices to get a feel for if this is the right fit, the right campus. Um, if, if the services are going to work for them. So while there are minimum ex expectations under the law, every office is a bit different because every campus is a bit different. And that's one really important thing when it comes to access and accommodation for parents and students to realize is that every campus is different. It has a different feel. It has a different mission. It has different goals. And so whether you're going to um, a local uh, technology college like the DATC, the Davis Applied Technology College, or, or something similar, just as an example, versus Weber State University versus Salt Lake uh, Community College. Um, sorry, I guess my face isn't showing, so I'm, I'm not sure. It must be on the back camera or something, so apologize for that. But I'll keep talking because I don't want to waste too much time. Um, so it's really important to uh, do some research and make sure that the mission of the institution that you would like to attend actually fits your mission and purpose. And sometimes that takes some exploration. 
So um, you can do that by going to the website, going and visiting, looking at the mission of the institution and looking at the kinds of programs under the, the college catalog that, that that specific institution has. So many students will come and say, oh, I want to go into welding. And I have to remind them that Weber State, while we have some aspects of welding, you're probably not going to be certified as a welder by going to Weber State. That would probably be better at um, a technology college. So that's the number one thing when you're anticipating post-secondary education is to think of all of the different options out there for post-secondary education. Even within an institution, students can um, participate in a variety of ways. Um, some parents think that you know, in order to go to a college, I have to go, I have to, my student has to be fully matriculated, four years, degree seeking, and that if that doesn't happen, that's not a successful experience. And what we know is that students um, find success in a variety of ways, and anything from certificate programs to uh, two to four years, um, there are a lot of good options. So just, uh, just kind of an introduction to, to post-secondary ed and to think about the many options, just at Weber State, um, because Weber State's open enrollment, there's quite a few options for students to come and try things out without having to be fully matriculated or um, go through go through the admissions process. Uh, there is an admissions process, but it's it's not as rigorous as other as other institutions. So I would really encourage you if you're thinking about post secondary ed, which you should be, everyone should be thinking about post secondary education, um, whether you're a student or a parent. However, look at the options that are out there. Um, so I'm going to start in just to give you an idea on the PowerPoint. So um, we talked a little bit about every office having obligations. Um, the reason we exist is because it's unlawful to discriminate because of disability. And this seems pretty straightforward. But in post-secondary education, um, even through the 70s, it was not uncommon to hear that someone couldn't come just because they had a disability, even if it wasn't a disability that related anyway to their learning. Uh, that was that was pretty common thinking, and so that lingers. Those the, that thinking lingers in stereotypes or in stigma, and so we work very hard on a college campus to really work against that idea that disability would um, exclude you from even trying a college education. The other reason we exist is that students often need accommodation, which means that for that experience to be meaningful, to have it be a truly equal opportunity then they need a to be able to request individualized accommodations for campus programs, activities, or services. And many people don't understand. It's not just the classroom. We're not just talking about ramps to get in, but also materials in the classroom, learning environment, tutoring, and all of the other things that, uh, that come with post-secondary education. Uh, just to kind of go through, this is the disability service framework that, that we use when we're looking at eligibility or kind of this question of disability. And there's many different things out there um, about disability. Obviously, in terms of access, we would love for the, the campus experience to just automatically be accessible to everyone. Universal design, everything works, but unfortunately it isn't the case. And right now, the law really puts a lot of responsibility and accountability on the student to request accommodations, to prove that they're eligible. And until that changes, that's really how um, disability service offices, uh, that their framework is built around that legal, that legal situation. So is the student disabled is the number one question we'll ask. Obviously, a student has to come in and, and claim disability status. So we can't do that without knowing. The second is, does the student's documentation meet guidelines? And our guidelines, um, th this has changed so much in the past 10 to 20 years that I've been working in the field that it's important to always check and find out what documentation is needed. And, and institutions are supposed to put that very clearly on the website, and ours is, is that way. Then is the request directly linked to the underlying disability? Often students will make requests for accommodations that are not um, specifically linked to disability. Yes, it would be a nice thing to do, but is it actually linked to the disability? Also, does the documentation actually support that requested accommodation? Or is it just, again, a nice thing to do? Was the request made timely? Um, was it actually made, first of all, and was it timely? This often happens. Oh, I, I need to retake three tests, or I need to retake a class because I needed an accommodation. We're like, yes, indeed, you'll retake the class. And so we always um, encourage students to, to do this before semesters begin, before classes start. But that's not always the case, and we do our best as, as we go on. And is the request necessary to enable a student to access 
um, the program activity or service and this is a hard one um, we're not in the business of, um, of you know in, improving students grades or uh, making it the, the, the ideal situation but actually looking at a necessary accommodation based on disability and is the request appropriate so this is a really hard thing and I'm not going to get into it because most of it's pretty legal but is the student otherwise qualified which means the student has to be able to meet the qualifications of a program uh, and that that continues throughout a program so if they if the students doing fine in general education but all of a sudden starts failing classes and in, in their program such as nursing um, and it's because they're just not understanding the material then we try to do as many accommodations as we can that would support the student but if they cannot pass the class then they cannot pass and they're not qualified to be there and that's a, a big change um, between K through 12 and higher education also direct threat and undue burden but we generally don't um, get into those too often uh, especially the undue burden financially or administratively because institutions of higher education have quite a bit of funding so it's hard for us to say oh we can't do that for a student because it's too expensive or something like that so th that's kind of the framework and um, it's kind of uh, tricky but basically students are eligible if they have a physical or mental impairment including health impairments that substantially limit a major life activity pretty broad definition but that's that's what we're working with so there might be like presumptive disabilities that we just kind of automatically yeah if you have this diagnosis most likely you're disabled it's most likely severe enough that you have a disability but it's an individualized law and so there is no list of like if you have this then you get these accommodations it's very individual and we look at the situation of each individual student so even with an IEP or a 504 plan coming in, we have to look at the new environment and what major life activities might be affected and what the essential elements of a program are and, and we have to find a new accommodation plan. So that doesn't mean that everything won't follow from an IEP or a 504 plan. It means the environment has changed and the requirements of the university may be a bit different and so we have to look at that anew and evaluate that um, request in the IEP or 504 and make sure that it's reasonable in the new situation. So a good example of this is um, students often request um, because of issues with concentration or sleeping and fatigue, some of these major life activities that are on this list, you know, because of that I may miss class on occasion or I may need extensions on my assignments seems pretty reasonable on the, the outset that yeah we should be flexible if students have these issues and they're communicating with their faculty members then why not why isn't that reasonable but we have to be very careful let's say that the student is asking to be exempted from um, regular attendance or timely attendance in a practical experience where they're working in the field and having to show competencies within a certain length of time like say 10 weeks or 15 weeks we have to be careful with um, whether that's a reasonable expectation that they're missing that experience or that they have extensions because they're not working and learning together in that setting necessarily in the same way. So those are times where that may not be a reasonable accommodation. The other thing is the environment has changed. So if you're only going to attend class one hour, maybe three days a week, um, and even as a full-time student, you may only have 12 hours a week that you're required to be in class, then you have more time to work on your assignments and to, to you know, spend the time that you need. And you can also elect to take fewer classes than that. So if the student's asking for exempt, exemptions on attendance or late assignments, it's very different from a K through 12 environment where a student is, is in class from eight to three or eight to four every day and there's not a lot of flexibility, not a lot of time for homework afterwards. It may be reasonable to have exceptions for late work then, but not necessarily in a college environment where you have a little bit more time to manage on your own versus um, in the school. So that's just one example of environment. Up to this point, are there any questions on what I've said or, or thoughts, things you'd like me to cover? I haven't seen anything come across, but. And again, if you have questions, feel free to type them into your chat box so we can address them. All right, so I'm going to keep moving on. Um, so these are the major life activities just uh, that we you know obviously the things uh, very basic like breathing and speaking and hearing accommodations would would match that you know maybe a sign language interpreter or um, being able to take breaks during testing if you have to have some medical um, you know a medical break or something like that for breathing treatment anything like that but what we focus on is the academic needs so in K through 12 
many of these um, major life activities, limitations related to them, are accommodated. So um, being able to, um, to eat, to breathe, um, some other bodily functions, and um, caring for oneself, those sorts of things, lifting, standing, they need to be accommodated even on a personal level K through 12. When you transition into the college level or into the employment level as an adult, those personal needs have to be met individually instead of by the institution. There's no legal mandate that those things be, uh, be accommodated. So all students are responsible for their own transportation, medical needs, um, even their own understanding of the material is considered a personal need. So tutoring is considered a personal thing that's not necessarily an accommodation. And that's very confusing when K through 12 that has been the case and it changes. And so it doesn't mean that students can't come, uh, can't participate in post-secondary education, but that institution is not legally obligated to provide those personal needs, uh, personal accommodations. And so students have to go to outside sources and it's very important that they connect with those um, outside agencies that provide personal assistance, whether it's a, through state funding or personal funding, um, that's, that's necessary for success in that environment and the institution's not required by law to provide it. So, of course, this is a big issue because we know that access to those resources really can be an impediment for students and um, so we do help refer to agencies and try to, to help um, students connect with agencies, but also in that transition it's important to reach out to agencies like Vocational Rehabilitation and Center for People with Disabilities and other agencies that can help, and family. Unfortunately, again, family is a big part of that. So, um, questions about that, the personal accommodations. Any, any thoughts or issues with that? It's a major change, a major change from, from um, you know, public school to higher education. All right, so we'll keep going. How much documentation do I need? This is one of the questions I get over and over. What, do, what are the documentation requirements? And it depends. That's the best way that I can say it. Is my IEP good enough? Is my 504 good enough? Um, how recent does this need to be? It really depends. First, I have to have enough that I can actually see that this is an individual with a disability. Um, a question um, often comes up about this. Um, you know, what, what is the standard? And that really depends on the disability. The number one thing, the number one thing that we look at in terms of documentation, and this gets overlooked quite a bit, is the student's own narrative. This is the most important part of establishing need um, under disability law, is the student's narrative. What is, that they can actually explain what their disability is, and what they need, or what they're requesting, and why. So it's important that the, the student is familiar with their disability. Um, sometimes I have students come and they're in the office and I have an appointment with them and their parents and the parents doing quite a bit of the talking and I say to the student, what, you know, what is your disability? And they're like, oh, I have a disability. And I'm thinking, how did you know to come here today? You know, that's on my office door. <laughs> so we definitely need to be preparing our students for that conversation. Um, that they're comfortable with, that they have a disability, that they're making a request. Um, and that that's okay, that they, that they own, that they have strengths and weaknesses, and they can work with that. So that's the number one thing about documentation. What is the problem with the student narrative, however, is that students often struggle <laughs> to articulate what they need. They don't always have a great understanding, and sometimes the disability itself impairs their ability to give a narrative of the disability. And so that's when documentation to support that need comes into play. Documentation is also required to just establish that there's a history of using services and accommodations. So yes, an IEP, a 504 plan, is an excellent source of establishing that history. However, if there's something different in terms of the environment or um, you know, different needs the student may have in, in that um, post-secondary setting, then we may require more documentation. This often comes up with hidden disabilities. So how... Um, in terms of um, hidden disabilities, the documentation can be a bit more extensive simply because it's harder to see. There needs to be a little bit more evidence of, of why this is needed in, um, to, to make that, um, to make something accessible or to accommodate. So generally I say um, with any kind of emotional disability, it's good to have something within three to five years and an actual history, not just a one time I went to the emergency room and I have anxiety, I had a panic attack, and so this is a disability. No, we need to see a history 
that this is ongoing or that the student is investigating that it may be ongoing before we, we just say, yeah, this is disability and you can you know, have this accommodation. Um, also, um, learning disabilities, it's very, um, very important that we have that full evaluation of what's going on with that learning disability because they're so very different, one person to the next in terms of their limitations. And it's good for an adult student to understand that that uh, many students with learning disabilities feel like they just, they're just not good enough, they're just too slow, they just can't handle it, they're not smart enough. And what we find with a full learning evaluation is that there are strengths and weaknesses, every student has them, and it's really eye-opening for the student to meet with a professional, to have a learning evaluation, usually a psychologist who specializes in that, to kind of understand a bit more about that disability, and it gives them kind of a a breath of relief to find out, you know, what is really going on? Why am I being considered disabled? So um, up to that point, I hope that that helps, but it, it really just depends. I wish that I could say you always need to do this or you need to provide this kind of a letter from a doctor, but it really depends on the student. The best thing is to start talking early with post-secondary um, disability service offices to talk about the documentation, the requests that are being made, and to get that help. Um, there's no, like, what can I get? Um, you know, right now that'll cover my student forever, ongoing, it just, it moves, it depends, it depends on the request and it's very individual. So I have a few questions coming up. Um, let me see what we've got. Um, tutoring as an accommodation. Tutoring referrals from a disability office or a service. Definitely a service that's provided in all higher education settings, a great service. But tutoring is not necessarily an academic accommodation that's legally mandated under ADA. So it may be an accommodation or treated as such in K through 12, but after that, it's seen as a personal need. And so individual tutoring is not necessarily an accommodation. It's kind of tricky, but um, being able to understand, rehearse, study, that is a personal need a student has, and so institutions are not obligated to provide that. However, there's quite a bit of tutoring on campuses. We refer students to all the services, and there's actually some money that comes from the federal government through TRIO programs and other programs that specifically cater to individuals with disabilities as a, as a group, but we don't view it as, a, as an accommodation request. It's a service. So hopefully that answers that question. Um, also, um, you need to request a 508 when you graduate from high school, different from a 504. I'm not really familiar with 508. Um, I would have to know a lot more about your son and what his situation is, but I can say if he needs an accommodation, um, then um, he should come and see us. We mostly work with 504 plans and ADA, so Section 504 of the Rehab Act. 508, I think, um, I'm not specific. I wish I had my, you know, I should Google it, but uh, I believe it applies more to technology and to electronic access, and so um, as far as I have seen with 508, it applies to like captioning and making sure um, there's accessibility and websites and things like that, but I would be happy to talk more to you about it if you wanted to email me on my website. You can find my contact info and I can look into it specifically. So anyway, that's documentation. I know it's confusing, but the best thing to do is to gather your documentation, make sure your student is familiar with their disability, gather what you have, um, from the high school, make sure the student's participating and, and understanding the disability, and then meeting with a disability specialist in higher ed as quickly as possible, even before graduation, up to a year before graduation, most institutions are, will assist in that process of, of getting the documentation in place before that transition happens. I work with students even as juniors um, to do that. So uh, that's really important to just start the conversation. Um, some tips about that. Making sure students are engaged in the IEP development and process, especially their junior and senior year. What accommodations are you actually using? What are you going to need? How can we anticipate preparing you for the next, um, the next level of education? Too often, some of the accommodations that are included in 504 IEP plans are not effective accommodations in higher ed, or they're not effective in helping a student get to a, high, a higher education environment. So if part of the accommodation is an adjustment to the actual curriculum, a lowering of the curriculum standard, so the student doesn't have to learn as much math or can use a calculator to do any math, things like that, that could be viewed as um, 
maybe maybe not preparing them the best way for college. And I know that there's a lot of conversation about that, but it's good to be talking um, to to those post-secondary education advisors early if students have any accommodations or services that change the curriculum or, or have um, been adapted, because that may, may be an issue. And, and that may be a case where a student is looking at a very particular program in higher education um, that may not require extensive math or something like that if, if that has been the case. So it's not that it's a no, it just definitely puts the student on, on a different track and we have to be mindful when we make accommodations in K through 12 that they may not be effective in preparing a student for post-secondary education. And there's a lot of conversation about that. We can have a whole webinar just on that, but it's important to remember. Um, some, of, some of the ones that I often see are, are accommodations around um, time management, um, attendance, um, you know, preparing students for deadlines and meeting deadlines and tracking their own time. And, and the purpose of an accommodation for that would be to help the student learn and manage and, and to request those similar accommodations or to communicate with faculty in higher ed about those things. So yes, students do have to work with faculty. Once they graduate, um, they are in the driver's seat. They are the ones that push the accommodation forward. So. Their narrative is important to help determine what accommodations they're going to request and need. That their understanding of their documentation and ability to provide that, they actually need to request the accommodation of the faculty and through the disability service centers on campus. So students must be engaged in the process and be supported in that, that they can do it, that it's possible, and that they feel good about it. So that's, that's really, really important um, in terms of of preparing students and their role to determine um, and advocate for themselves in the next level. Of course, disability offices and advisors help with that. Of course, we talk about best ways to approach faculty. Of course, we provide verification letters and assistance in that process, but the student is the one in charge of that. And parents and assistants and coaches and aides and mentors and even disability office folks um, generally do not get involved in that conversation between a student and faculty unless there needs to be a negotiation or there's been a denial or there's a problem or something and then we kind of get involved in that. So, and even then parents generally not. Generally um, I'll get a call from parents and then I work with the student on things. So anyway, I hope that's helpful. We can talk about more questions you have about that. Um, let's keep moving. I'm kind of stuck here. Let's see. There we go, okay. So it's really important to understand differences between accessibility and accommodation. Accessibility is really this idea that we can make this environment as usable for as many people as possible and there's legal obligations for that. And so campuses are really working on barriers to you know, the environment, communication, technology, admissions, all those things. And we're focusing on inclusivity and appreciation for diversity. And like I say, I think we're in a great time in terms of um, campuses really beginning to understand the value of having individuals with disabilities on campus. They, they bring a different perspective. Just recently, I've begun teaching um, English 1010, an introductory composition class, and, and it has been very fun to try to make my class as accessible as possible. But all the materials are in multiple formats, audio and visual and print. And, and that, um, that I'm working on deadlines, how to set up deadlines that are effective for students, and, and appreciating that not everyone learns to read and write at the same level or at the same speed, but that that doesn't mean that, that that's not a valuable experience in the classroom and that they can't um, add to the experience of everyone else in the classroom. It's been very fun, and I've been very supported on my college campus in, in making those, those adjustments and in having conversations with setting up a curriculum, which wasn't the case, I would say, 15 years ago. 15 years ago, it was kind of like, well, we have to do this. It's a law. We have to do it, and it's kind of a pain, and really should students be here if they can't deal, if they can't deal with life, and and it's changed quite a bit, and I think that's um, a lot to do with parents and students and also disability service providers on campuses who are trying to, to move that conversation forward, but what we know is that there's, there's gaps in that, that we can't always make everything accessible for everyone, so we have to make accommodation. And that's that agreement, arrangement, adaptation. Some people call it a special service designed to meet the need of an individual. And that's why the documentation and student narrative is so important because it's so individual. And we have to negotiate that. And, and that is the role of the disability support services on campus is to negotiate accommodations and to increase accessibility wherever possible. 
So that's kind of hard. Some, some um, people believe that the Disability Service Center on campus is like an advocacy group for individuals or students with disabilities. Not necessarily. Um, we're there more to protect the campus from liability than to necessarily be advocating for students. Many of us do both. We try to balance both. But really, it's that le legal obligation to keep the university from getting um, in trouble and to increase diversity as much as possible and inclusivity. So um, kind of tricky, but you know, if it's not accessible, then the student has a responsibility to, um, to make a request to the faculty and, and to go through the process through a disability service office. So this is kind of a step-by-step -step process. It's kind of small. I just realized I, I probably should, should make that bigger. But really, the first step is to prepare all of your things. And that should be happening. That's a lifetime thing. You know, preparing for self-advocacy and getting the diagnosis and limitations and any kind of recommended supports together. That's not a, a one-time meeting or anything. But definitely, if you haven't had a meeting to talk about you know, what's necessary to move on to the next level, you need to start doing that with your, your current um, high school support staff and with your, with your child and with the, with the post-secondary advisor. The second is to actually request the accommodations. Meet with someone in a disability office, make those requests, discuss them, come up with a plan. And that can take over a year even to, to find a sweet spot, I guess, with the student, what they're comfortable with, what they need. And so it's OK to start talking about this. But it also can change. It's very fluid and very flexible. In post-secondary ed, I may make a change to a student's accommodation plan day to day or week to week, month to month. And some I don't change at all. They come in with a plan, and it works. And they use that the entire time they're at the university. So just so you know, it's, it's flexible. The student can come in and discuss that or work with faculty in, in our office. And it's, it's pretty seamless if, if the student's engaged in the process and there's a, a reasonable um, request. The step three is to share that information with their faculty to verify that they've actually gone through the process of working with the Disability Service Office. Everything's in place. And then they start talking about the needs um, that they may have. And most of the time, arrangements are made, and it's, it's really simple. Faculty are very responsive. Um, you know, a little bit of uh, goes a long way in terms of um, just the student knows the faculty. They work together, and they make those arrangements. And often, our office comes into play with things like testing accommodations or or interpreting requests, um, just simply because the faculty is maybe an expert on how to set that up, but we can help. And then the student uses the accommodation. And this go, this at any point, we can go back through the steps. They're not linear. It's not like you do this, and then you do this, and you do this. It, it can happen anywhere in between. We can go back through this process. So just if um, you want to look at that, any questions about the process? All right, um, faculty have very specific roles and obligations to meet as well, that they should respond to students and follow proper steps. And so our office does get involved if a faculty does not respond. So there are, in, uh, there are instances when faculty feel like a request is inappropriate, maybe for their class, or they do have some of that stigma, or they don't want to work with students. And that's when our office gets involved in, and helps students in those situations. So there are you know, if you ever have a student who's like, well, I'm not getting any help from this faculty, they're not responsive, or they're telling me things like, well, ADHD doesn't really exist, or anything like that, then that's when our office would get involved and make sure that the student has the support they need to, um, to either transfer classes or um, do a formal complaint, um, any of those things. So I have referred students to, um, to legal counsel, to their own in, uh, private legal advice, because I feel that there's a faculty who's not responding appropriately, even when we've tried all of our campus um, negotiations. And so we're not opposed to that. It's pretty rare, pretty rare. I'll say that. In 20 years, I've only had to do that once. So um, most of the time, we can find a, um, a place to meet and that works for all the parties. And that's called the interactive process. Students have to be involved with that as adults. Um, in the adult student education area. So uh, it can be a little stressful, but we get through that, and it is pretty rare. Um, let me talk just briefly about um, our CAT program. And I'm going to sneak out to our website. I can't remember how to do that. Michelle's going to help me. <laughs> I want to go to the disability website for Weber State. So let's talk first just quickly about services that we provide um, that are actually helpful for students. And one of the main services that post-secondary institutions provide to students, all students, is their website. And we want to make sure websites are accessible for all students. So if there's ever an issue with the Weber State one, please let me know. But it's pretty accessible. And the main thing that I want to point out is just this A to Z index. 
this is a really, really important place for students to go and start learning and exploring the resources. Some students um, are kind of waiting for someone to tell them about the resource. And this is a real change from K through 12. I like to say to students, in K through 12, you kind of go through the process and all the services and people find you. You are just in a classroom and everything comes to you. Parents are helping and teachers are helping and other students are there and, and it's all built in. It's all built in. And then all of a sudden you transition to employment or into post-secondary education and you then have to go and find all of those supports. And sometimes you don't even realize you're receiving those supports. You don't realize that you've had extra help with math compared to other students because that's just your reality is this is how I get help with this. So it's really important that we start helping students recognize the helps that they're getting that may not be just a, a regular thing once they go um, after, after graduation. So A to Z index. And this is great. So my favorite thing is just D for disability. You can search the disability office. You can see discrimination policy, disability coordinator, and services for students with disabilities comes up. That's our website. You click on there. And it goes right to the website with all of the our mission, our contact, our services, our policies, some quick facts, additional resources. You can see our hours. And there's some fun under the additional resources. This is we're going through some changes on our website, so I hope everything works. But under additional resources, there's disability in the news, there's legal resources, disability rights, um, all kinds of things that we have linked, scholarships, um, different associations that are that are really great resources for students. And then we also have um, under policies and services, there's some links to different campus offices. Um, how to do different things like get your textbooks in alternate formats and just different things that students might need. So that's great. Um, it's important that um, students go in and kind of mess around. So that's disability. But let's go through A to Z index. Somebody already brought up tutoring. I'm concerned about tutoring. I'm amazed at students that I don't see for like a year. They come in my office and say, I really struggle with classes and you know it takes me longer to read and understand and to memorize. I have working memory issues, executive functioning issues. They say, well, have you ever looked into tutoring? And they're like, well, how do I do that? You go to T on the website, you search tutoring, and look at all this stuff that's here. So when we click on tutoring services for Weber State, here are all the different offices on campus that provide tutoring. There's appointment tutoring and drop-in tutoring. There's supplemental instruction, all kinds of things. And I told you about um, student support services and our TRIO program actually is a grant program not just at Weber State, but almost every institution can apply for this grant, and many do, that primarily supports first-generation low-income students and students with disabilities. I'm not sure why that's not on there, but that's actually one of their eligibility requirements. So you can see there's, there's tutoring, book loans, grant aid, so definitely something you want to pay attention to if you're a student with a disability or a parent who wants to help their student. Also under tutoring, um, tutoring services, there is the Writing Center. Two things I always highlight to, for students are the Math Tutoring Center and the Writing Center. There is tutoring available whether you are in a writing class or a math class. You can still go there and get tutoring in those subjects. So let's say you're taking an Earthquakes and Volcanoes class and all of a sudden a module pops up on you know, scientific notation. and You can't remember that or you struggle with that math. You can go to the Math Tutoring Center and get help. Same with the Writing Center. We'll just click on that one go to the Writing Center and all different um, things there. You can um, you can talk to the tutor about your papers. You can actually submit papers online. It's for any type of writing. It can be by drop-in or appointment and it's free. There's even online, like I said, where you can submit a paper online. Many students have some social anxiety about meeting about their writing. They already know they struggle with writing and then they have to go meet with someone about it. So sometimes that's a great way to start is online online tutoring. So those hours are there and they're all trained. I actually do a, um, a really in-depth training for our tutors on campus, any of the tutors in any of these centers, on working with students with disabilities, being open, and they are fantastic. They are so willing to adjust what they do and learn how to work with someone who has maybe a, a writing disorder or a reading disorder or dyslexia uh, type, type of symptoms like that. So anyway, they're great and that's just one example. Other places in this index, students really should just come in here and kind of goof around a little bit. I think that's the best. Um, w for wellness. If the student goes to wellness, if I can find it now, wellness program for students. Our university and most institutions have a wellness coordinator. 
that talks about all different kinds of wellness, including intellectual, emotional, social, environmental, financial, physical, spiritual, and students can go to any of these wellness activities or actually have a wellness coach. They can go and meet with a wellness mentor and talk about this. So I'm really struggling, I'm really anxious about talking to people. I want to set some goals for myself to get better at this or I want to get to know other people. You can. Um, that's part of social wellness. Um, I'm trying to balance work and school. It's not going well. I have time management issues or I'm struggling with that. You can go and talk to a wellness coach. So I refer quite, I refer quite a few students to this source on campus and we work with their office very closely. Other sources, um, we have a counseling center. Counseling center on our campus provides so many resources. We'll go there. They have groups and individual sessions. They can learn more about any type of um, issue that comes up from um, ADHD to anxiety to pornography, self-esteem, eating disorders, all sorts of things. You can click on those and learn. So ADHD is a fun one. We'll click on that one. This is one I refer quite a bit. Talks about what it is, symptoms, um, what to do if you think you have. There's a referral to our office. Yay, that's on there. Different things to do um, to help with ADHD. Um, there's some video links. There's also some really cool um, apps that they have here that you can that maybe help um, individuals with ADHD to, um, to focus or to organize things. So they also have a, a peer support group. So lots of things, different resources um, and bibliotherapy, which are books. Um, there's a screening tool. If you think you have ADHD, there's bibliotherapy, where, which are books that they've actually put in the library on campus that address issues with ADHD. So lots of sources here for students. And what we know about students is they're most likely to go to a website and look something up than they are to ever talk to anybody about it. So that's why this is set up this way. There's also resources for parents on that site, especially about suicide, um, Changes you might see in your child when they when they leave the house after after K through 12 and all of a sudden they're in this new role. So there's some really great things there that might help um, because the counseling center on campus is familiar with that and students can go in and talk about it. So, um, but it has some information about what can I do if I'm worried about my child? Can I call and check in? And that changes. Uh, the parents often take a supportive role rather than the most active role in terms of students' health and well-being as adults. So anyway, good things there. Tell me about any questions you have about a resource you think should be on campus or you're wondering if it is on campus and um, anything we can do to, to help point a student in that direction if you have questions. We also refer to the community for quite a few things that the campus doesn't doesn't have. Weber State, for example, doesn't have any kind of, um, it doesn't have a source to actually diagnose um, learning disorders, so full psychological educational evaluations. Weber State doesn't have a source for that, so we refer out to the community or to other institutions that do. Uh, some institutions have that built into their campus environment. It's not a legal mandate, and the ones that do generally have graduate programs where their psychologists in training kind of need access to, to a number of students, and so it's actually cost effective for them to do that, but Weber State doesn't have that, so we have to refer out. But other institutions will, so you can always check into that if you're wondering about where to get a diagnosis, where to get documentation. So let's go back to the disability website. And I will show you our CAP program. Institutions in the state are really trying to help. Um, sometimes it has been the case that post-secondary institutions are there kind of waiting for students to show up and that transition is not an issue that we deal with. That, that you know, transition is something K through 12 and parents and families have to deal with and you guys just have to make it in post-secondary ed and good luck. But post-secondary institutions have been looking at the the transition numbers and the numbers of students who are not succeeding in higher ed or during that transition, we're trying to make some changes as well. So you'll see quite a bit of talk about this, about retention and recruitment and all sorts of things. And, and a lot of institutions, disability centers are trying to come up with, with a way to help. So you'll see um, programs directly um, targeting stu um, students with um, intellectual disability at some of our institutions. You'll see programs that target students who are on the spectrum that have autism. You'll see um, programs that target students who want to get into grad programs like med school or law school. And, and so there's, there's quite a bit um, that we're doing in terms of, of specialized programs to help with transition. Ours is called Creating Achievement Through Transition, so we'll click on that. 
And this is a website that's completely ran by students. This program is completely student run. It's ran by students with disabilities for students with disabilities. And the mission is to help identify students who are kind of motivated to go to college, but they're a little bit worried about it. Maybe they're, they're, they're kind of stressed about that. And to say, hey, I stress too, and I can help you, and I, I want to you know, mentor you through the process. So to positively influence their success. So when we first started, it was simply we you know, assigned a few volunteer mentors to incoming students who asked for a mentor, and that went OK. Um, it seemed to help, but students still struggled. So then we set up kind of a regular meeting plan uh, once a month, a regular check-in times for those peers, and that seemed to do a bit better. Then we've been working with our local, um, local school districts. So for us, that's um, Davis School District, Weber, and Ogden School Districts to actually help students who are juniors and seniors come and have positive experiences on the college campus with our CAP peer guides. So they start talking to them when they're a junior before they're even anticipating. Some students are like, nope, college is not for me. I'm just going to barely graduate. And then they come and they have these visits on campus with our CAT students and they realize that, yeah, this is for me and this is a reason to not just barely graduate, but to actually work hard and learn more math and do better in my, with my time management and all those things because I really want to be in this environment. And some of these are students who have um, you know, moderate learning disabilities who think, nope, reading, writing, math, not, not for me, no more of this. And they come and they talk to students who have similar limitations and they realize that it's doable, it's possible, and it's a place they want to be. And that's really our goal with the program. And we haven't really had a lot of assessment yet because what we know is it takes about five years for to really assess whether we're seeing a good turnaround. But we're already seeing a lot of positive experiences with juniors and seniors who are continuing. And one of the biggest things we've seen is an increase in our number of concurrent enrollment students. So high school students with disabilities who have IEPs or 504 plans who are already engaging in the college work through con uh, concurrent enrollment classes because they know they can do it and they can have that support. So that's been one thing that we've seen. So this is just a great, it's a, a peer mentoring program and if you have a student who's a junior or senior, even if they're not in those school districts, it's a good time to have them come in and um, either sign up for a Wildcat Experience Day or register as a CAT student to get involved. So really great um, things going on. And they, I mean, these students have fun together. They, they go out and do service projects together, they go bowling, and of course, while they do those things, they talk about school. And they talk about how do you deal with a faculty who's grumpy, or, or how, do you, um, you know, how do you set up your accommodations, or things like that. And it's really, I think, helpful. Well, we set it out purposely. We wanted students to just pass their classes. That was the goal, to do better in their classes, to have more students come. And what we found is that social experience, connecting with other people, is so powerful. And we know that, number one, for students to be successful in post-secondary education, they need financial support. So if they get their financial support, we help them with like financial aid, FAFSA, scholarships, things like that, and employment, of course, balancing employment. So if that helps, then the next thing is that we know that makes students successful from our research is if they connect to someone and know that it's the place for them. They feel included, they get involved, then for some reason, all of a sudden, the math is a little bit easier. The writing is a little bit easier. All those things that they think they struggle with so much become easier. So that's, that's really the purpose of CAT. Um, you can go in and look at the calendar. It looks like for right now, they haven't put the, the titles of all of the events, but um, the students feed this. So I have to get on those student leaders and say, hey, your meetings are there, but we don't know what they're about. So get that updated. But they're really fun. Um, students who... Uh, they have a, a similar experience. They sit around in a circle um, for one of the early meetings and talk about disability and what it means to them. And of course you hear like, I hate this. I hate that people think I'm disabled. I don't think I'm disabled. Or, or why do we have to register with the disability office? It just seems so unfair. Like, it's as if school isn't hard enough that we have to go into all of this too. Or, gosh, why won't my parents leave me alone? They nag me to death about this and I really just want to be on my own. Or, oh, I miss my parents. I'm homesick. Or, you know, all sorts of things that they have conversations about. And one of the common threads is at some point, somewhere in their life experience as a student in K through 12, they, were, they either were told or got the impression that they were not smart enough or capable enough to go to college, that that was not their plan. And some of them responded saying, want to bet, want to see, you know, I'm going to make it. And others, of course, just kind of had low expectations for themselves. And so when I hear that, it just kind of um, inspires me more to 
to think of how I talk to students about disability, um, what kind of expectations I'm putting out there, and letting them determine their future based on you know challenges and, and perseverance and I think dignity and risk, risk taking in terms of educational experiences versus, oh, I'm so scared, I don't want you to do too much, you might fail, or I don't know if this is for you. You know, we have to check our language quite a bit because that's, at least that's what I've learned from working with the students is how important it is that that they have a positive experience when talking about disability and that they are given opportunities um, instead of being limited in those opportunities through the, through the disability experience. So anyway, that is what I have. It's quite a bit. I've been rushing. I haven't seen any questions coming up, but I would love to spend some time answering questions if you have them for me. Postgraduate education, yes, all of this applies to graduate, postgraduate, yes, all of it applies. Do other schools like USU have the same things? Yes, they do. Um, let's see. Now, not being able to know if my son would be able to accomplish a higher education is a problem itself. You know, it is. It's a problem. What if he can't accomplish it? I would say, let him try. Let's see. I didn't know if I could accomplish it when I went either. And Man, I, I learned a lot about myself, things that I had to push myself further on. And, and I think that we can't take that opportunity, that full educational experience away from individuals with disability. So what if it doesn't go well? Well, you learn something. You work for a while and you try again later. And that's what we see with students. Um, a fake hope to have a higher education. Uh, I would say the number of students I've seen who have IEP plans or psychological evaluations that say this student will never succeed, they're intellectually disabled, they shouldn't do this, and I'm talking to them and they're a senior saying, I'm just struggling with this last class, I might need some extra time on the test or this assignment, and then I'm going to move on and do my thing, and I think, wow, heaven forbid you took that to heart when you're, you're ready to graduate. So I don't know, I think I would uh, err on the side of like pushing the student as far through education as possible and supporting them. How many students are in CAT? Right now we have... Um, 80 students on the list. Uh, we started with three. We now have 80 students. They come and go, so I can't say like at any one CAT meeting or at any one point in time how many are active. That's that's so iffy with college students anyway. <laughs> but I would say at any given CAT meeting, we have probably 20 to 30 students there and about six peer guides who volunteer their time and come. So last year, our peer guides put well in 800 hours of volunteer time working individually with their peers, their peer students, helping them with everything from we had a student who was being blackmailed about her parents' immigration, and one of our peer guides stepped in and, and got her referred to a source on campus to help with that, um, to some, some legal resources and also to some counseling. And we've had simple as like, I'm struggling in this earthquakes and volcanoes class. Oh, I took that class too. Let's sit and chat about it and I can show you what, what worked for me. So that's really helpful. Um, let's see. Um, yeah, hopefully, hopefully um, I've given you some tools. Let's see if I've missed anything. Um, and um, I, we have a handout at the Parent Center that kind of aligns with what we've talked about today. So I will send that out to everybody that registered in the next few days. It just has all the contacts for the Disability Resource Centers, information about financial aid and scholarships, information about resources on campuses. So I will get that out to all of you as well. Um, it just kind of puts together a lot of the information we've discussed. It has information for the CAP program and other disability specific programs on other campuses as well. Um, so hopefully that's useful to all of you guys. Um, yeah, just to just to wrap up final just a final thing is just just be aware that there's so many post-secondary education opportunities. So I just talked with a student this morning who is very worried. Um, I have an intellectual disability. I don't know if this is for me. And we chatted a little bit. Their parent was there. And the student decided to take some community education classes on cooking, healthy cooking that Weber State offers. It's like a six-week class. It costs $45. And, and that's a great start. And of course, the student will have accommodations through our office, even in a, in a class like that. So anyway, keep, keep an open mind um, to all kinds of post-secondary. And, and, and we work together with the Parent Center. and, and I can help refer to any of those other programs that come on the list if you want to reach out to me personally with my email through my website. Okay, well thank you everybody so much for coming. We appreciate your time and we hope you enjoyed the webinar. 
um, feel free to reach out to us for further questions, and um, we will get that additional resource sheet out to you. Thanks again for your time, and we appreciate your attendance today. Have a good afternoon.